have a quorum, so let's please rise for a Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for all the men and women overseas and our first responders who put their lives out there for us every day so we have our freedom and our safety. Thank you. All cell phones are on vibrate mode. All cell phones are on vibrate mode. If you need to take a call, take it outside of this room. Again, if you need to make a call, make it outside the room. Thank you. Go ahead. So, Mariella, can we get lights on in the middle here? In this area? Okay, here you go. Great. All right, so we have um, our distinguished uh, district attorney, Darcel Clark, here. Uh, where did she go? So, do you mind going to the mic? What service? Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Happy New Year. Um, it's always a pleasure. Say hello to everybody. It's always strange being here because my back is always to somebody, so I don't mean to be rude, but it's an honor to be here. You know, I'm taking the time uh, in these first few months of the new year to go around, one, to say thank you to everyone because last November I was re-elected, so now I'll be your district attorney for another four years. Thank Yay. you for that. <laughs> and also to really talk to you about something that is, you know, making the headlines each and every day, which is the new criminal justice reform laws that have taken effect. Now, you all know that I am the district attorney, which means as a member of the executive branch of government, my job is to enforce the laws as a DA. I did not write them, I did not make them, but I do have to follow them. So I just wanted to come out and just talk a little bit about the new laws, answer any questions that you may have, and just give you a little, uh, give you a sense of what some of the things my office is doing. Thank you. Doing, I have a little laryngitis too, so forgive me. What my office is doing, to effectively implement the laws. So the new laws took effect January 1st. And I think two of the two main areas that have been somewhat of a concern to members of the public is the bail reform and the discovery reform. So let me talk about bail quickly. Everybody knows what bail is. Somebody's arrested, um, a judge may set bail, and that's just money that they put up in order to guarantee that they come back to court, right? Pre, under the old bail laws, the judges had the opportunity, or the discretion, I should say, to determine whether or not somebody should be in jail or out while the charges are pending against them. Bail is only for pretrial, meaning that anybody who even goes to jail in on bail is there. They haven't been convicted of anything yet. Everybody's presumed innocent until proven guilty. Under the new law, the legislature has taken the discretion away from judges and they have made it now automatic release for a number of crimes. And mostly all misdemeanors, with the exception of domestic violence and a few um, sex charges, as well as nonviolent felonies. Violent felonies, the judges are still able to set bail if they need to be. Between the old law and the new law now, one of the things that the judges were never allowed to consider was the dangerousness of the person or them being a danger to the community. So with the new laws now, you, you know, the post, the papers every day, oh, this person was arrested, they did this, and now they're out. How could that be? How could that be? Look, I was one of the DAs that knew 
that it was time for the criminal justice laws to change. There were people, because they didn't have money, that were sitting in Rikers Island who were charged with the same things as other people, but if they had money, they would be released. So they needed to be some reforms. However, you know, some of the reforms that they made have gone, you know, a little to the extreme, I would think. But my job is to make sure that there's public safety. And I know the officers of the 49 know what I mean because that's the job that we do each and every day. So a lot of the community, you know, or communities or some advocates are in favor of the reform, others who are not. My job is to make sure that I protect the public safety. So any opportunity that I have as a district attorney where I feel that bail is appropriate, I am going to ask for it. But you know that over the last four years, I have been doing sort of bail reform all along. And those people who were charged with those nonviolent, low-level misdemeanors, if I was not asking for jail as the ultimate sentence, my assistants were not asking for bail. So when this new law came effect, the impact of it on the Bronx was not as great as some other places because my office has been working diligently with the defense bar, with the courts, to make sure that we can either, those people who are not going to be held in, that they get services that they need so that they don't continue to commit crimes in our community. We're talking about those people that have mental health challenges, those people who are drug addicted. So we've worked with various programs in order to maintain that population so even if they're charged with a crime, they're connected with services so that they will at least come back to court. Well, the new law provides for that same thing as well. So if a judge, even though a judge is not going to set cash bail, there are some non-monetary restrictions that they can put on people in order to ensure that they come back to court. And that is um, supervised release where the courts have to keep in, they have to keep in contact with the court be, and make sure that they're reminded that they have to come back to court. And now they've approved for electronic monitoring, like the ankle bracelets, things of that nature. So there are you know, ways to make sure that they come back to court. The one loophole that I find in the, in the law is that you see some people who are these repeat offenders. They get out on a non-qualifying bail offense, so the judges can't hold them in. And they go out and they get rearrested for it again, or something else, non-qualifying. Go before the judge, have to be released, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that they do need to do some tweaks to the law. I think most of it is fair for the most part, and I'm going to do as best I can to make sure that the public stays safe, but we're still fair to those who are accused. But I think the one loophole, and I'm asking you to speak to your elected officials to let them know that this is one area that they need to fix. Those individuals who continue to go out and commit um, you know, crimes that are non-qualifying offenses, the judges should be able to say, you know what, enough is enough. You know, you can't, you know, thumb, you know, give, give the system the finger by saying, well, since it's not qualified, I could do it as many times as I want. No, we're not going to have that. And I'm going to continue to fight to, to make sure that those people that are really causing harm to the community, that if I could get bail, I will make sure that I do it. So that's one aspect of the law. Secondly is the discovery. And what discovery is, is the exchange of information between the prosecutor and the defense. And the defendant has a right to know the evidence against them when they're charged with a crime. Under the old law, the district attorney had the same obligation to turn over evidence to the defendant about you know, the evidence that is against them, but we had a long time to do it. Some DAs would wait right before somebody's taking the stand or the eve of trial, and that's not fair. Even as a DA, I have to say, that's not fair. And you know I spent 16 years on the bench. It has to be balanced. They should have to wait till the day before they were on trial to find out the exact evidence that the DA has against them. Furthermore, what was happening or could have happened was that defendants were pleading guilty and they didn't know the evidence against them because we didn't turn, not all DAs turned over all the discovery. So what the law is now, they tweaked the law that now we have to turn it over more expeditiously and that is 15 days. 
So we're going from one extreme to the other. Now, I get that we have to give it to them, and I think it's only fair that they should have it. I even agree that they should have the discovery before they take the plea, because they should know what, you know what the evidence was against them before they decide if they want to plead guilty. But 15 days is almost impossible. And these officers here can tell me, we have been working feverishly since April 1st when they passed the law to figure out a way how we're going to get all this information to defendants. And the thing is this, anything that the police department has or the Department of Corrections has or any other agency outside of my office, anything they have that's related to an arrest, it's deemed that I know it. And it's in my possession. And it's not. So we've been working with the police department. You got to give us the paperwork. It's got to be 15 days because if we don't turn these things over, there's a chance that the cases will be dismissed. That's the ultimate sanction against us. So we've been working really hard. You know, we ask the city for money because, as usual, they pass laws, but they don't put any money behind it. So we asked for money. We did get some resources in order to be able to work with the discovery. So we're doing the best we can that we could get it done in 15 days. And I want you to know that my staff has really been breaking their backs to make sure that we are compliant with the laws. And I'm going to tell you, I'm extremely proud of them. And you should be proud of them, too, because they're working each and every day on your behalf. And that's the people of the Bronx. The one thing that now, when you talk about turning stuff over in 15 days, that includes the contact information for any victims or witnesses, as well as any testimony that someone gives before a grand jury. Now, you know, one grand jury is a secret, right? And secondly, what victim or witness wants a defendant to have their information in 15 days? Now, they did put some safeguards in there for us, we, as a DA, can file for a protective order saying that this is a danger for a defendant to have the information about the witness who's going to be testifying against them, and a judge will make a determination whether or not we have to turn over everything. Before, when we had to turn over discovery, we could redact or, or delete the actual name or address or identifying information about that witness and still turn it over to the defense, and then right before trial, they'll find out the name, et cetera, et cetera. Now we got to do it in 15 days. So we're working every day to ask for those protective orders from the court, as well as I'm making sure that people are secure. I started three years ago a witness security program where I have detectives that are assigned to witnesses and victims if they feel threatened in any way because they have been brave enough to come forward to testify against somebody at trial. We still have that program. I put more money in it. I'm going to make sure that happens. Also, with the reforms, we have, we have um, set up alternate contact ways for defense attorneys to be able to reach out to the victim, to the witnesses. So we have a, a, a contract with Verizon where our witnesses now will have a Verizon number that we give them. That'll be the number that we give to the defense. If you want to contact them, use this number. It doesn't, it doesn't relate back to where the witness is. And of course, any witness to a crime, even when the defense reaches out to you, you have the right to say that you don't want to speak to them. But at least they will not know where you are in your identity. So those are some of the safeguards that I put in place to make sure that we need people to still continue to cooperate. Because if you don't, if we don't, then the people who are committing these crimes are going to be able to get away with it. So those are some of the, that, those are the easiest two things that I can talk to you about um, the, the law. And I'll answer you know, any questions that anyone has. Okay. Sorry. Um, all right, so I got Al here, I got Tony. I'm gonna, I want to see your hands, though. Cause I'm, keep them up until I give you a thumbs up and I'll write them down. Hi, Josh, Al. Thank you for coming. No problem. Uh, how many people that come to, that are released on bail, show up for trial? Are you seeing any difference in the amount of people showing up for trial? Actually, it's been too early to tell because it's only the 23rd day of January. We started January 1st. But I can tell you this, in other states where they have this, 
they didn't see that much of a difference. And as a judge, and even as a DA, I can tell you, for the most part, people come back to court. Okay. They and, do come back to court. And the um, how much time frame do you think would be feasible to, that would make sense for the uh, DA to get information to the uh, defendant? Or would well, it be a fair time that we could talk to our elected officials and say, look, go up to Albany and, and let's tweak this law to give you X amount of time? I think, well, for misdemeanors, like the time, the, the, the time frame of the law as to when we have to be ready for trial varies in degrees of the crimes. So a B misdemeanor is 30 days, a A misdemeanor is 90 days, and for any felony, it's six months, right? So I would say 15 days is totally unrealistic. I can't get you DNA, you know, the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, the ME, we can't get some of those things. There's a lot of things we can't get in 15 days. So I would say at least, and we fought, you know, as DAs, we lobbied the legislators before they did this thing. Okay, we get it. We got to turn it over, but not 15 days. I would say 30 days, 60 days, you know. Right now it's like 15 days, and then we have to go to the court and ask for an extension. They'll give us an automatic extension for the most part for 30 days. So that's 45 days. After that, then it's going to be, if you don't have it, you know, you could be penalized, we could be sanctioned. But the thing about it is that now we have to turn over so many different reports and so many things that we didn't have to turn over before necessarily. So for example, under the previous discovery law, we had to turn over the information for anybody who was going to be a witness that we were going to call against the defendant. Now the new law says, forget about it, we don't care whether you're going to call them or not. If they know something about the case, you got to get all the information. So that's what's causing it. So for example, it happens in the 4-9, the 4-9 responds. Let's say eight police officers respond, they all wear body cameras now, and get the body cameras for all eight of them. Even though only two of them, it was a partner, the two arresting officers and a partner that did it. Some cases, those homicides, you get all kinds of detectives showing up, everybody. We got to get the body one camera and the paperwork for all of them, whether it's relevant or not. We had one case, it was a DWI case. So, you know, somebody's arrested for drunk driving. They go to the four or five priests, I mean, uh, Highway 1, they blow into a breathalyzer machine, and it gives a reading as to whether or not, you know, they're intoxicated or not. We had a case where a defendant did not blow, right? But we still have to give them the information about the machine. Why? <laughs> They didn't blow. So this is why some of it is too, it's a lot that we have to do. But I've trained my staff up. We've had a lot of trainings. We got to hire some more people. And we're going to do it because that's my job to do. But it would be easier. 60 days would be. If we had a little more time. And even if, let's say, for example, I get it because people are in jail. Let's say it's expedited for those who are incarcerated. But those who are already out. You know, we give them the most important things and we could make sure by a certain date they get all the other things. So anything, you know, any moderation is just going to be easier. Dr. Tony? Good evening. Good evening. Uh, first of all, how's your husband feel about this? Well, you know, he's got 37 years. He's like, yeah, okay. Well, he's seen it all, right? He's seen it all. All right. Now, really, uh, I know that I know the problems are going to be for, uh, that's going to come about because it is. Uh, are you going to, I, I think, you're saying we should call to our, go to our assembly men and people. I think also the five DAs should tweak this thing. In other words, give it up for six months, whatever you want to give it to. Then you people come. I'm sure you're all going to have to tweak. Uh, you, you got some input to do. And I hope that's what you're going to do. Maintain your, your statistics and come with it's in six months. Because this thing's got to be changed. I mean, uh, what's happening? I mean, I, I, I know about homicides. Uh, you, know, you know, that's going to be a serious problem for the police to find witnesses. They ain't going to come. Once they get the word gets out, you lose them. And uh, you're going to see the homicide rates go up and the convictions go down. And we got a great homicide CEO in this place, and he's not happy. Yeah, no, I know. It's... But, it's a challenge. It's the DA. You got, you know, in other words, the five DAs got to come back, get together, and make recommendations with us. Thank you. Thank you. Well, any help we can get, we appreciate it. But it is you, it is your voice that means the most. Because I can tell you, 
as a district attorney, I went to them. You know, I know all the elected officials, you know, state officials here in Bronx County. They all heard from me. But you know what? There's 62 DAs in the whole state. And we have a district attorney's association that they, you know, the, the legislature is not that fond of them because for years, you know, they were like, we could do whatever we want. You know, they had certain senators that was in favor of it. And when the, the you know, the legislature changed, um, they were able to get this law through. And, you know, it was something that was long overdue. So they weren't real, they really didn't want to hear from the DAs because they think, the problem stems from the fact that the DA has caused the problem, which is not true. You know, everybody doesn't like the DA until they need me to do something for them. I mean, I'm here for regardless of who, who it is, but I mean, my job is public safety to make sure the people of the Bronx are safe. And I'm doing that and still being fair. So I believe in a safer Bronx, but fair justice for those who are accused as well. And I think we've been doing okay and doing it pretty well. But, to, you know, make me do my work with one hand tied behind my back is going to be difficult, but I'm going to do it. Uh, so Jump along and I know you'll get the job done. Thank you. Commenta. Hey, Darcel, how are you? Hi. Thank you for all that you do, you and your staff. We appreciate everything that you do. So just some, some comments and maybe a question you can answer. So Rikers, right, closing down. There's a whole bunch of things going on with our jails, right? There's going to be borough-based jails, I think, that are going to be going up. I know there's plans out there from the city to, to, to build these jails well, I, I know it's a, it's kind of like a rhetorical question but what what is our leadership of our city doing what do they think that they're doing I mean to, to, to put these laws in place right everybody here has pretty much been a victim of a crime at some point in their lives right our odds of being affected by somebody who's a repeat who's been let out has just gone up substantially if not exponentially so everybody's job and quality of life has just gotten harder and the quality of life has gone down. So uh, I'm just curious if what's the correlation between the closing of these jails, opening of new ones, and this particular law, letting people out that um, you know should perhaps have you know I know what you're saying about a fair fairness, people can pay, can't pay, I get all that, but what's the connection? Well, first of all, with Rikers, <clears throat> you know, it's already passed that they're going to close it by 2026 is the goal. Um, they want to get the population down to like 5,000. And if they could get the population down to 5,000, they think that these four smaller jails in the community is going to be better. Families can see their loved ones. Lawyers can get to their clients. The court, the judges can get the, the defendants to the court faster. And that's, I mean, okay, that's all well and good. Rikers is dysfunctional and violent, and there's a lot of problems. And I know because I'm the DA that's responsible for any crimes that happen on Rikers Island. So they're right about that. And I can't do anything. They decided to do this, so I can't say, no, why don't you, you know, renovate Rikers and that, that train left the station already. So they're building these smaller jails. The population has been going down. It's about 6,000 people there now. In 1990, there was 22,000 people in Rikers Island. So people are already out on the street. And the ones that are in the jails now are the ones that are accused of very serious crimes. And that's why they're in there. The others, they're given opportunities to wait for their trial outside. And I can tell you in the Bronx, look, when we knew this was coming, um, the court said, well, we can't wait for January 1st and then just open up the jails and let everybody out. So slowly but surely, we knew it was coming. We had to evaluate the cases that we had, and we worked through them. And I can tell you by December 19th, I think the courts had warned every DA and every, just the public in general, by that date, if they were in jail on a non-qualifying bail offense, they were going to be let go. But by the time December 19th came, we didn't have any people in. Because we've been working all along with the defense bar, with the communities, with victims, with everybody, to resolve the cases that we have of those people that were in, and those are pretty much misdemeanors and nonviolent cases that they can wait outside. And even before this law was passed, people were out. So it's not like now, all of a sudden, oh my God, these people are out. These same crimes that they could have been eligible for bail before, sometimes they weren't in either. So it's not really that many more people, but 
you know, the focus is on it now. So every time something happens, the paper, you know, gets on it. So like I said, it's been 23 days. We don't know. I can predict that, you know, things might not go well or something really, really bad is going to happen, but I don't know. But I'm praying that everything <laughs> works out all right and we'll be good in the Bronx. And, you know, so far so good. You know, we have a lot of problems here in the Bronx, but it's better than it was, you know, 20 years ago and 25 years ago. And we got to be thankful for that. And that's because of concerned members of the community like you, that you're making sure that we know who the real crime drivers are. And we're now focusing on them as opposed to the police having around everybody up. So that's, that's where we are with that. And the Bronx is getting a brand new jail, which I'm not happy about. You know, so schools are closing, opening up jails, not a good look to me. Christian Amato? You know, wherever it is, it's a, the toe pal. Right. You know, where on where um, Brock, no, Brock is in my haven. If any of you, the, where the old Lincoln Hospital used to be, a million years ago, the old Lincoln Hospital, right there. So it's on Brock now, like 141st Street, Southern Boulevard over there. Okay, Christian. Thank you for being here tonight, Darcel. I have um, two questions for you. One, uh, earlier you were talking about bail reform. Um, lately online, you're seeing a lot of people being arrested and going right into, uh, going right back to crime. Uh, as people are talking about the whole repeal bail reform concept, you're seeing people share stories about a criminal who was let go and right, went right back into crime. And you talked about this a little earlier, but I'm curious um, how true that is and if there's any figures behind that, how, how many people are going back to crime. And then my second question for you is, um, earlier this week, uh, you released a statement saying that you are going to move forward uh, by declining to prosecute drivers without a license, and I just want to know a little bit more about that. All right, let me start with that. So driving with a suspended license um, takes various forms. Sometimes people get behind in their child support, so somebody thought it was a good idea, you don't pay your child support, then we're going to suspend your license and you have to pay all this money if you have tickets. However, the reason why it was suspended, you have to pay that back, and then you get your license back. But what that, all that does is if somebody needs their car to go to work in order, you know, to make a living, then if they don't have their license, they're not going to do it so you'll never get the money anyway. So what I've decided to do, and we have hundreds and hundreds of cases like this. Some of it is parking tickets. That's Sometimes true. people That's don't true. have all the money. It piles yeah, up or whatever. Right. So what I did was look at our data to see how many that. cases we have and what was the base, what's the basis of those, um, you know, operating without a license. So some of them are violations, some of them are um, unclassified misdemeanors. And what I decided to do was, that is something that the Department of Motor Vehicles should take care of. I'm the DA, I don't, you know, I shouldn't be collecting, I shouldn't be the collector for, for DMV. So if, if I'm looking at each driver, and anybody that's charged with that, I'm looking at their real driving record through DMV, there are other records we can look at. And if they don't have a history of dangerous driving, or when they were stopped by the police, they weren't committing any type of dangerous driving or something that was a danger to public safety, then I'm gonna send them to DMV and let DMV get that money out of them. It's a civil case. But those who drive without a license and they're driving recklessly and they run over people and they hurt people and things like that, those are the ones I will continue to prosecute. Great, uh, last question, Yahe, Obi. Hi, Darcel. Thank Hello. you for coming. How are you? Good. Uh, I'm the public safety chair, and you probably remember a year ago, working with Councilman Mark Jonai, we had a meeting here. The meeting was about, there was two individuals with 60 priors, mm -hmm. 60 each, and they keep coming out. And we came, and, and everyone was pointing the finger at the other. So we had the DA here, the chief judge was here, the police captain was here, and the elected officials were here. We said, okay, no more pointing the fingers, let's put you all together in a room. That was our concern back then. We had concerns. I know you're saying the Bronx is safer t from 20 years ago, but I feel like last year we were concerned about people stealing from CVS. Now it's getting a lot worse. So we want you to hear us out. I know you're saying your hands are tied, but I am talking to my elected officials. I, I've spoken to my assemblywomen and uh, we're, we're pushing forward. But we need your help, we need you to remind them. This community here, at least community board 11, 
is safe overall, but we need to keep it that way or make it safer. We don't want to go the other way, and it seems like we're going the other way, unfortunately. I agree, but again, like I said, they, they passed it. We got to figure out a way. Look, my, my, my role not only is public safety, but when I'm looking at these cases, I think the way to solve them, and I think I said this before when we had the meeting before, we need to look at the underlying reasons why the people are committing the crimes. And the two individuals that you talked about, we eventually, you know, did something. We, we raised the prosecution because we could have, wanted. one of them had a drug problem. He eventually went in, I mean, we both got them both in, finally, to some type of treatment. One of them I knew had a real drug problem. We didn't. There's people that are homeless. There's people with mental illness. So those systems need to work in the community as well. Because the default should be them and me. And I do want to give your office credit for, for that, for those two individuals. You did work with us, your, your, your office attended most of our uh, public safety committee meetings, and you did help us. So thank you for that, but we need a lot more help. Well, I need your help. I'm willing to help. I'm doing all that, that I can. But if it's not qualifying, if they say they can't be held in on bail, I can't do anything about it, other than try to find out the reason why they're doing it and try to resolve the problem that way so that they don't need to continue to reoffend. Darcel, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Our next distinguished, uh, distinguished guest is the Congresswoman Ocasio Cortez. Do you mind please coming to the mic? Hello, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. I don't know who, where to face. There's so many folks behind, so many folks ahead. Um, just checking in and saying hello. I just got back from DC on Friday, I believe it was. All the days kind of meld together. Um, and just wanted to give you all a couple of updates. Um, as you all know, impeachment has now passed the House. It is on the floor of the Senate um, currently. So that's all going on. It's no longer Congress's problem. It's no longer the House's problem. <laughs> um, it's up to the Senate now. And uh, as you know, many people are kind of following up on a lot of those issues. We were able to secure a lot in terms of funding. Um, many of us have here in the district have families in Puerto Rico, and so at the end of last year, I had to fight tooth and nail, but we were able to secure um, 10 million in funding to make sure that we do a lot of environmental cleanups on the island. Um, there's still a long way to go, especially uh, with the earthquake and a lot of the disaster recovery that needs to go around there. Um, we were able to move a lot of funding into um, opioid treatment to get people out of addiction. So we were able to secure a very large amount of money, about, well, right about 20 million into some of those treatment programs um, for our community and communities across the country. Um, I'm trying to like move through all the updates that I have for you all. Uh, we introduced about five pieces of legislation at the end of last year. Um, one is to acknowledge the real poverty line. Um, there's a huge gap in terms of who is eligible for certain services like Medicaid and uh, affordable housing. Um, and a lot of people are being left out um, that are technically above that line, but still need, um, still need help. And so uh, we've been working to move that up. We've been working to make sure that we roll out um, some housing relief for us in this community, that's something that we're all really feeling, whether it's a mortgage or whether it's your rent, we're working really hard to make sure that we address some of those key issues. Um, but yeah, I actually literally just had a town hall across the way on healthcare, um, and we just ran right over here for the community board. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you all have right now, and as always, it's a pleasure being here and dropping in. Anyone? Yeah. Fran first. <laughs> How involved are you with the infrastructure funding? I mean, as you know, New York City bridges and roads are falling apart. I know that there's quite a bit of infighting between the executive and the legislature, but are you guys trying to make a little bit of a headway and stop butting heads? Yes, thank you for asking this question. It's uh, it's. Funny that you asked this because just this morning I was meeting with the construction laborers um, out at La Una um, and talking about this very issue because infrastructure used to be one of the few bipartisan things that we used to be able to get done. Republicans were okay with it, Democrats 
were, were on board with it. And lately, they decided to make it a political football. Um, and so one of the big issues that came up with the last infrastructure bill was that it was trying to privatize everything, trying to put more tolls and have those tolls not even go to public funds, um, but to basically be owned almost by a private equity group. Um, to be kind of for-profit infrastructure. So that's what we're really contending with right now, but we're working really hard to make sure that we reinvest a lot of the infrastructure. I do think we're able to secure uh, a little more funding this year. Um, it's tough because the Republicans have the Senate, and so it's been uh, a little bit of a struggle to negotiate expansion of those funds, but that is definitely something that we're working on. And I do think that there is some appetite um, from the White House to, to get something done on it. So I do think hopefully we'll be getting some movement on that, but you're right, it's crazy. And your question uh, reminded me of something that I really want to ask for your all, your all's help with. Uh, we have the census coming up, and it's starting in March, the first round of it. And the problem is that our district in our community is one of the least counted communities in the country. And the problem with that is that when our families do not answer the census, the federal government thinks that less people live here than they do, which means our schools get less money than they need, which means our infrastructure and our, bro our roads and bridges don't get prepared for the population that we have. And, um, and that's one reason why last year I fought so hard to make sure that the question about immigration status is not on the census. It can be asked by a lot of different other agencies, but one of the reasons why a lot of people do not answer the census is because they get scared. Whether it's their housing status, their immigration status, um, whether it's their income status. Uh, and when we don't answer the census, then we get less funding, we get less teachers, we get less police officers, we get less firefighters than we need because people literally think less people live here than, than they do. Um, there are some neighborhoods in our community that are counted at about 60 to 68 percent of the actual reality, which means we're only getting 60 percent of the funding that we need in our community. So for you all, especially as local leaders, uh, we need to make sure that we get the word out about that and everybody um, can answer the census. It is safe, it is confidential, and it is illegal for that information to be shared with any other government agency. So I wanted to add that because that's a huge part of the infrastructure funding or lack thereof that goes to our district. Great. Uh, Earl Suckridge? Yeah, I had one question. You, you raised the issue of um, P3s as far as tolls, mm -hmm. public-private partnerships. Mm -hmm. I know you're familiar with that. Um, and some of the issues that you're saying, uh, I'm just trying to find out what's your opposition to it, mm -hmm. because I know in P3s have worked in other states where the, you have the partnership, the private partnership taking care of the toll, mm -hmm. and some of the money is being funded back to the state, in mm -hmm. states and cities. So I'm trying to figure out where. For sure. So it's not um, an all-out rejection of public-private partnerships. It's the deal that's being struck. So if 90% of that toll money is going to a Wall Street group, um, we're going to have serious problems with investing in our infrastructure. And so with some of those things in that um, proposal that we saw, it was, it was far and away too much, um, the lion's share of it. But in terms of the actual um, partnership, I think that's a legitimate conversation to be had and policy to look forward to. Um, in terms of the state and like the immediate surrounding areas, that's not something that Congress is in charge of. That's something um, that the state tends to be in charge of. Al Angel. Hi, Congresswoman, thank you for coming. Of course. Uh, just I'd like you to bring a message back to Washington. I think we're all a little bit tired of the partisan politics that's going on in Washington. Uh, you were there, uh, and not you, but you, know, you as, uh, in general, are there to service the people, to hire and help like everybody here is. Uh, your job is to serve us, and what's, what we see, and I, I'm sure everybody agrees because it's all over the place, one party says yes, the other party says no, one party says no, the other party says yes, and it's hurting us. 
It's hurting us, the people. So please bring that message back. I don't know how you fix it, yeah. but partisan politics has been it's the rule of thumb now and that's not a good thing for us yeah no and i appreciate that it's exhausting i'll tell you it's truly exhausting um and it it gets tough because people really dig in their heels um one of the things that i think that we've been able to do as it's so funny because like as much as people kind of like to label me as like this firebrand and whatever um we actually i actually have been able to make progress on certain bipartisan issues um, the issue is when people stop becoming ideologically motivated, just in terms of print, or rather motivated by principle, and start becoming motivated by party. And I can tell you as someone on the inside, there's so much pressure to just do what your party tells you to do instead, and it is related to fundraising, which is why I'm very proud to be one of the only members of Congress to reject all corporate PAC money. Um, it allows me, thank you, <laughs> it, it gives me a degree of independence so that I can put my constituents first. And I don't have to ask a big pharma executive if it's okay to vote for a bill before I vote on it. Um, and so what that does is that it actually surprisingly has freed me up to certain bipartisanship on certain issues. Um, we may come to, we may have different reasons, but quite a few of us come to the same conclusions on certain things, especially when it comes to civil liberties. So one big, um, one big advancement that we're able to make to kind of close the gap between the two parties, I said on the oversight committee, is having to do with facial recognition technology. All these companies are trying to scan your face and make your face part of a mass database without your consent or without your knowledge. Um, one in every two Americans has their facial recognition uh, information in a database and most people don't know it. So half the people in this room have their face in a facial recognition database. Um, it's extremely important that we address this issue. I think it's a civil rights issue. I think it's a privacy issue. Um, and it's something that uh, we were actually able to bring together some of the most far, like furthest right members of Congress have actually come around on this issue as well um, because civil liberties is one of those areas where we're really able to find common ground. Um, so we were able to hold a hearing on it. Um, but I want all of you all to know that when, if you, this is something that's coming up a lot in airports. So next time you take a flight, uh, if you go to a Delta terminal and they say that your face needs to be scanned um, in order for you to get on the plane, your face does not need to be scanned to get on that plane. They kind of make it look like it's mandatory, but it's not. So I wanna give you all that information as we work on legislation to actually address this issue. I wanna arm you all with the personal information to say, no, I have a ticket. You don't need to scan my face um, because all of that gets centralized into different databases. So if that's something that um, impacts you, if you care about your personal privacy and want to make sure that that information is um, kind of at arm's length, then I just wanted to kind of give you all that, that information as we work on a, on a bipartisan solution to that issue. Great. Uh, Avril Francis? I just want to say thank you so much. Um, I'm not, I would ask a few questions, and instead of doing it, I, I want to thank your office for responding to me for you to appear on my program, the Avril Radio Show. So to come on and talk about these issues because I realize there is a lack of information in the communities where people are not aware of the census. Mm -hmm. And we are aware, I want to thank Monty Fury um, for opening the door to educate us that it will be online. A lot of people are not aware of that and this is one of the reasons that I ask you to come on the show, to speak about it, because the people need to understand the seriousness of the census, what it does, it affects housing, it affects so much, but the community is lost. Yes, and uh, you know, thank you for bringing up that point, uh, because that's something that's so important. This is something that, I mean, we've been fighting tooth and nail on, but they're really setting up our community to be at a disadvantage in the census. Just as you said, the first round for our community is online forms. 
which is not how most people take the census or want to take the census. Um, the most effective way of answering the census is the paper form. And it's not even that long. Um, the paper form is like one, two, three pages, um, and it's just a handful of questions. But answering online can be really complicated, and some people just aren't as comfortable answering it online. Um, and so for you all to kind of understand a little bit about the process, the first round for, like some people are going to get paper census questionnaires, and other people, I believe, are going to kind of be mailed instructions on how to fill it out online. And then the second round, other people may be able to get a paper ballot. You see how confusing this is? And then, um, and see who gets answered it there. And then the third, an enumerator will come to your house and knock on the door and ask you some of these questions. Um, so with that being said, as soon as we get the most updated information, we will try to share that with the community. Um, and also, we will be having, yesterday we filmed a public service announcement with Lin Manuel Miranda um, in two languages. And it will also be translated in three to four more languages, I believe, um, for so that the city and, and our community here gets an understanding. But it's been tough because they've been really confusing every step of the way, so we're trying to keep uh, the most up-to-date information. But, you know, in the whole month of March, it's super helpful to just ask everyone you know if they've answered the census question, because it's so important. Our kids will not get the school funding that they need if we don't answer this. Our, you know, everything will be under-resourced if we don't make sure that everybody we know in the community um, answers the census. Great. Uh, final question, or, well, final two questions, Christian and then Rabbi. Christian Mauro. Good evening, thanks for being here. Um, I heard you earlier talk about data and the census, and I'm curious uh, what your plans are in the next six months uh, to bolster America's data security as it pertains to the election. Um, in this area alone, there were tons of poll sites in the last two elections that went down. So are there any plans around that? Yeah, thank you. Um, this is another key question. This, so this here, what's tough about this is that this is at the intersection of the state and the city. Um, the BOE has its challenges. <laughs> and, um, and as a result, sometimes poll sites are I'm not always operating at peak efficiency on election day. My own poll site, I mean, I have a crazy story. On the night, on the day of the general election, I couldn't even vote for myself for two hours because my entire poll station was closed. Every single machine was broken at my poll site. The good news is that this year is the first year that, uh, as you all may have noticed, we have early voting. So I want to encourage um, as many of you all as possible to take advantage of early voting. We already just had our first kind of, our first election that was our first uh, practice round, I, I'd say. Not a practice round because it was for real, but um, it was our first wave uh, election where we were able to ease into early voting. And it adds another three to four additional days of voting um, where you can show up before you go to work or after you come home. And, uh, and the idea of that is to give people as many days and many more opportunities as possible to vote. Um, on election security, the House has passed an election security bill. Unfortunately, Mitch McConnell will not bring it up for a vote in the Senate. Um, and as a result, our elections are more vulnerable this year than they were even in 2016. Um, we had maybe one, two major foreign actors trying to manipulate US elections. Now that it happened in 2016 and everyone else saw that um, they were able to get away with it and that we haven't done anything, now everyone else wants to get in on it too. China, Iran, etc. cetera. And so, um, so we wanna make sure that uh, on, you know, I, I think the actual counting of your ballot is one question, but the other thing is just be very vigilant about what you see on Facebook. Um, there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation that's deliberately being put out there. So always check your facts um, and always kind of follow it up. If you see something that sounds a little crazy, it probably isn't true. And so um, it's really important because 
our demographics and our communities are especially targeted. And uh, in 2016, the communities that were targeted the most were actually people on Facebook over 40. So um, make sure we're hyper vigilant about that, um, both in the information that we consume and also just getting our votes in early is gonna be super important because we hate showing up to election day, there's a three hour wait and the machines are broken. And final question, Rabbi Fuchs. Okay, thank you for being here with us. It's great from your busy schedule. Okay, I don't know if this is so much a Washington question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, homelessness. It seems to me, just from my vision, it's all over the place now. Manhattan, you got cardboard people sitting on the street, block after block. The Bronx, I guess all other boroughs too. And I think the reason the reason that it's happening is because maybe they're afraid to go to the shelters or it's just better sitting on the street but I just see that getting worse and worse and worse and I don't know if you have an answer or anybody has an answer but where do we go before and I, I have pity on these people I know some of them could be real some would not be real but most of them was probably are real and they're suffering in the cold they're sitting in the subways, they're sitting in Grand Central. What could be done, if anything? Thank you, Rabbi, thank you for that. Um, and it's a, it's a question that we all should be asking because it's a question about human empathy and it's also just a question about the society we want to live in. Uh, it's not in your head. Um, homeless, rates of homelessness are skyrocketing in the city. Right now, we have the highest rate of homelessness in New York City since the Great Depression. But you contrast that, even though that the, it's at a, its highest rate, there are three empty apartments for every one person experiencing homelessness in New York City. One of the leading causes of homelessness, unsurprising, unsurprisingly, is the rising cost of housing. Um, when rent is two, three, four times what it was a few decades ago, the people who are on the street today are you know, they started off middle class people, and we don't think of that um, in that way. But so many of us are one health accident away, or one emergency away from losing our apartment. Um, and it's, it's truly, truly a crisis in New York City. Um, it takes city, state, but yes, there are federal actions that can be taken. One of these things, one of the ways that we're trying to address this is, at least on the federal end, trying to adjust what gets deemed affordable housing. Because as many of us know, what gets called affordable housing in New York City is not affordable at all. I'm seeing affordable housing units go up for people and families making $150,000 a year. That's not affordable. Um, some folks are blessed and that's you know solidly middle class but there are people that are making fifty thousand dollars a year sixty thousand you know that need um access to those kinds of uh, facilities and so what we're trying to do is focus on something called the ami the area medium index um, that's what a lot of these affordable housing um, buildings are pegging their affordability to and by the way these folks are getting tax breaks to build housing for people who are in upper income brackets um, and or in just solidly middle class income brackets. So we need to expand the scope of what's affordable. We need to work on the Community Reinvestment Act, which can help people get access to low interest loans so that they can have a, a home without having to deal with super high interest mortgages. Um, but at the end of the day, this a lot of this has to do with real estate speculation and how people are trying to use and flip um, homes and treat homes not as something to live in, but as a commodity. And that's one of the biggest issues that we have. Um, my mom, she got priced out of New York. She now lives in Florida. And uh, she was kind of on the brink of foreclosure. Our family was having a really tough time. My dad had passed away, et cetera. And uh, when we were able to stave that off, but she eventually had to sell her home. And when she sold it, in a no-name LLC came in, offered her all cash above the asking price, because the whole point was to take it 
and to flip it and to turn it and to double it in price. And what we need to do is recenter um, housing as something to be lived in, uh, first and foremost. So there are federal policies that we're working on to make sure that we can ease in that transition, but uh, right now, one in every four luxury apartments in New York City is empty. And all these buildings are going up and nobody is living them, living in them. And if you go in Manhattan at night, none of the lights are on in these buildings because they're being used as empty LLCs for people to park and hide their money as an asset, um, including abroad. One of the other areas that we can work on this too is in the tax. Um, there was a tax that was repealed for foreign developers who wanted to buy homes and residences in the United States. And the point of it was to say, you know, if you live here, then you should be able to have preference in buying a home here. And so if you lived abroad and you were trying to buy your second or third apartment in New York City, there was an 8% additional tax. So you had to buy, you had to, ooh, oh, you had to pay more if you were gonna have a second or third home here. Um, that tax was repealed in 2015, and since then, the average price of a two-bedroom, even in Queens, even in a neighborhood like Jackson Heights, has gone up 80% in three years, which means that families aren't able to live in these homes. Um, so those are some of the things that we're working on on the federal level. There's a lot that we need to do um, on a city level in terms of zoning and other things um, to make sure that that we address this because you're right and there are places where people where you see people who are experiencing homelessness in places that you never saw them before in Parkchester you know we never used to see that um, because it was predominantly focused to be a community that people could afford to live in now people are struggling to live in their homes right, the final question Angelo Antonio good evening my name is Tony Signorile also known as to New York. Why I'm saying that? Because I am an immigrant. And I'm fighting for the Columbus Day to remain on the calendar as it is. In 2017, as you know, we fought about maintaining the statue. And this is an issue still going on nationally. My understanding was that you were not in favor of maintaining the statue. How do you feel about maintaining the holiday now? So, um, so the statue was a city issue, not a federal issue. So, um, did those did not support us. Pardon? Did not support us. Ah, well, I think this is also an area where our community needs to talk it out, and I'm not trying to. It's like an hour into this meeting, and we're discussing. Oh, okay, sorry. So, um, in terms of the federal campaign on this, again, I think that this is something to bear out. Um, you know, there are a lot of Native peoples in this country um, for whom it, there's a whole discussion about this about on, on justice. Um, one of the things that we say, though, is that the holiday that we want in the fall is Election Day. Um, we want to fight for Election Day to be a day off. We want Election Day to be the holiday um, because people need to be able to have a day off in order to vote. Um, that has been how we have weighed in on this issue. Um, and there's a lot of, that's a whole can of worms that we can have a whole town hall about. Um, but I want to let you know that that's kind of where we're starting off there because there's a lot of different communities. Um, and it's my responsibility to make sure that I'm listening to everybody on this. The second question is, I would appreciate, I am also part of the Columbus Coalition, and we met last night that we feel that a lot of elected officials, they're not educated about Columbus, what it did. They think that he only killed people, which is not true. Uh, the other thing was that we wrote to you, to your office, and I understand you are all over the world, but we never received an answer, and we were very upset about that. Um, I'm, I'm sorry you experienced that. Um, I'd love to follow up with you because we just finished our, our um, review of 
local correspondence, and to our knowledge, we've responded to every constituent. We're not able, I'm not able to respond to everyone in the world who writes me, but I put our community first. And if your address is here in New York's 14th Congressional District, you should get a response each and every time. And if that didn't happen, then I'm happy to follow up with you and make sure and figure out what went on there. Well, our headquarters is over the Columbus Citizen Foundation in New York City. Okay. So it's not in your district, but I still feel a reply was necessary. Okay. Well, if you want to follow up with our office personally as a constituent, then we can definitely get you an answer on the issue there. Um, but this is definitely a very sensitive issue for a lot of people. All right. So. Um, thank you very much. Of course, thank you all so much. And as always, it is the honor and the privilege of my lifetime to be able to serve our community in Congress. And my office is always a phone call, a visit, or a letter away. Um, our Bronx office is near Parkchester. I am co-located with Assemblywoman Karina Reyes's office. Um, Destiny is right here. You've seen her plenty. Um, and uh, she helps handle a lot of our Bronx casework. Um, additionally, if any of you all want to take a visit to Washington, D.C., my office down there is able to help secure any kind of ticket to our nation's capital that you want. We're able to personally tour you in the house galleries. We can, you know, spring is coming up, whether it's um, touring the White House grounds and the gardens or anything like that, we're here for you both in DC and here in the district. So we thank you all again so, so very much. And till next time. And uh, um, Congresswoman? Uh, a board member didn't want to ask this question because they didn't want to take up too much more time in the meeting, but um, Columbus State aside, why can't we just add a, add a federal holiday for Election Day? Is we do, we we've got that bill. We've got that bill in the House, so we're working on that. So that, that is a concern. Thank you. Uh, so we will move on to the 49th uh, Precinct. Uh, Community Affairs Officer J uh, Detective Jason Wood. Good evening, everybody. My name is Detective Jay Sturdivant. Um, community Affairs at the 49 Precinct. Uh, I'd like to kind of share something with you. It's, it's good news. I'm eligible this year to retire in September. <laughs> but the good news is that I'm going to stick around. I'm going to stick around for a while. Yeah. I got to say, though, looking at everybody here and everybody sitting on this day and people sitting in the audience, I see that you all care for your neighborhood. And it, that fuels my fire to work even harder for you all. So I feel like you guys are my family. So that's one of the biggest reasons why I choose and I have chosen to continue my career as a, a community affairs detective at the 49. So thank you all for that. Thank you. Yes. Um, Happy New Year. Um, it's a new year. It's 2020, obviously. We have new challenges. Um, first thing first, I, I want to, uh, the captain, uh, Captain Nativ, couldn't make it tonight because he had a pre-scheduled engagement that he had to attend tonight. So he sends us all well wishes. Um, we have a new police commissioner, uh, Chief Shea, uh, sorry, Commissioner Shea. And um, his focus is the youth. And he's planned to uh, spend a lot of energy and time on trying to develop programs and community-based programs for our youth um, to you know, get them off the street and to uh, get them on a better path. Sorry about that. Could you give me a second? Could you take it outside, please, because it's interfering with the meeting. Thank you. Go ahead, Jay. I'm sorry. No, no, no it's okay. Um, so we're focusing more on our youth, and in the, in the, uh, particularly the 49 precinct, and more outreach and more resources for them, and more things for them to do. Um, programs to just try to get them off the streets into a better path. Um, I wanted to explain a little bit about the role of the NCO, Neighborhood Coordination Officers, versus the role of a Community Affairs Officer. 
And it's pretty much similar, but the only difference is we both take care of community complaints and try to address quality of life issues and to try to resolve um, complaints amongst res residents to keep you informed of what's going on in your neighborhood. The difference between NCOs and community affairs is that uh, NCOs are more in the street, they're more of an enforcement uh, unit. Whereas community affairs, we work more closely with the commanding officer. We are able to give the commanding officer more of, uh, of our time um, so we can better serve the community. I'm still available. I think the 49 Precinct has one of the greatest uh, NCO programs. Um, not saying that and being biased, uh, but the 49 Precinct, our uh, NCOs and community affairs, we work well together. We communicate which helps us to better serve you all. Um, and also, I just wanted to, I'm not gonna be too long, I just wanted you guys to know that in 2020, our projected uh, goal is to put more information out to the public and continue our transparency. And what we're gonna do is put more content on our social media platforms, so I'm not sure. I know a lot of you follow us, um, but we encourage you all to continue to follow us on Facebook and on um, Twitter, Twitter, our Twitter uh, account, and what we, ch the type of content that we choose, that we're going to start disseminating more of, are informational, um, wanted flyers, information that we needed, missings, upcoming events, upcoming social events, community events, uh, precinct events, but more so, I think we get a lot of feedback from. <coughs> What I've been noticing since doing handling and uh, posting stuff on social media are the wanteds. You'd be surprised how much people reach out to us, particularly to my office, any motions. and also some of the NCOs with valid information to help us close cases. So we noticed that that has been a success, and we're going to continue that. So I encourage you to follow us on all of our social media platforms so you guys can get the information. And we continue to ask you to help us help you. So thank you very much. I want to introduce Officer Manderos, he's the Crime Prevention Officer. He's going to kind of give you guys a quick synopsis or rundown of our crime patterns and trends and possibly some safety tips that you guys can utilize, okay? Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm Officer Manderos. I'm your Crime Prevention Officer. Um, as Jay said, I'm going to give you a quick rundown um, for the last... 28 day period, aka the last month, uh, crime in the Fortnite precinct has risen about 5% as related, um, as compared to last year at this similar time. Um, our rise in crime has been attributed to robberies and grand larcenies of automobiles. It's mostly the grand larcenies of automobiles, however, um, we have, are experiencing a trend in. Hondas and Acuras being stolen. When it comes to the Hondas, it's basically Civic Accord CRVs, um, with emphasis on the CRV. Uh, for Acura, it's specifically the MDX that's being ta uh, being taken. Um, I've gone to some community meetings and I've expressed uh, some crime prevention measures that could be used to um, protect your vehicle if you happen to own one of these vehicles. Um, the we are currently uh, tracking the ways in which these vehicles are being stolen. Um, we're starting to get a better idea on how they're being stolen. Um, and we are working towards uh, stopping uh, this particular pattern of theft that's happening in the 49 Precinct. Um, and just to be clear, it's not just the 49 Precinct experiencing this. Um, the, the thefts of automobiles have actually uh, uh, risen by around 95% in the borough, uh, uh, borough-wide uh, this year, um, in the same period over last year. Um, the next um, issue was robbery. Um, I believe our robberies are up 75% for this 28-day period as compared to last year. Some of those robberies are attributed to um, uh, shop uh, start actually of shoplifting, um, where 
person goes into a store, some sort of store, and tries to take something off the shelf, a employee or store owner uh, confronts the person, and then that person uses some type of physical force to leave or to take the item, or um, some type of uh, weapon uh, is shown, and at that point it turns into uh, a robbery. Um, I've also been going to uh, some of our community stores uh, that had been affected by this and basically telling them not to uh, try not to confront these people, um, try and get as many identifying information of these people as possible and just don't confront them um, because we've noticed that in terms of shoplifting, um, there's more, it seems, seems at least lately, a little bit more leaning towards the line of weapons and violence. Um, I don't know why that is occurring. Um, it just seems it seems like an increase of violence when it comes to shoplifting lately. Typically, that's not the case, but for the past few months, that seems to be the trend. Um, now, along the lines of crimes that are happening uh, that are noteworthy in this area, um, we've had recently a, um, a shooting. Um, a male was shot around the 2400 block of Bronxwood Avenue. Um, it was not a random encounter. Um, it was uh, basically uh, stemming from a disagreement or from an argument. Um, our detectives are investigating uh, the case, um, and when more information <coughs> is gotten, we will give it to you. Um, uh, we've also had, um, which you might have seen in the news recently, um, a stabbing on Gun Hill Road. Um, that one also um, occurring because of some type of disagreement. I believe in that one, uh, two people were um, stabbed or slashed in that incident. Um, no one was uh, killed, it's just uh, injuries. Um, once again, our detectives are investigating. Um, we've had a few other noteworthy crimes as well. Um, one was on White Plains Road. Uh, we had a jeweler um, burglarized. Um, people broke in through the roof and stole um, a large amount of money and jewelry. Um, our major case squad is actually handling that investigation and um, hope and they are currently investigating it. Um, in regards to that, we've noticed a pattern of those types of break-ins in the Fortnite precinct in the last few weeks where individuals are going through the roofs um, and breaking into okay. locations. Um, I've been looking at the complaints and there doesn't seem to be a rhyme or reason or connection between the uh, burglaries. For example, one was a jewelry store like I already mentioned, the other one was a laundromat, and the other one was a hair salon. Um, so in terms of business type, it, the, there's no real correlation. Um, thankfully, um, within uh, I believe it was uh, yesterday, um, through the outstanding work of our precinct officers, um, and with the help of emergency services and aviation, we believe we were able to stop those burglaries by arresting two men that we suspect committing them all. Um, they were caught here on Morse Park um, trying to break into another laundromat. Um, thankfully, because of their quick thinking and their ability to surround the location, uh, the gentlemen that were um, inside of the store got trapped and we were able to take them into custody. Um, and I believe, I, I believe that's all I got for you at this point. <laughs> so thank you very much. Hold on. Uh, oh, hands, no. First, uh, Darrell, then Al, then Sandy, then Linda. I have one question. Good evening, everybody. Um, I just wanted to know: um, Are you do are you guys doing anything in regards to like some of the subway stations? There's a lot of like shady characters hanging around there sometimes. You know, which, um, I'm not, which, hmm? which uh, station? Uh, Allerton, sometimes um, Gun Hill, Pelham Parkway. There's like people just standing out there. You know, like when people exit. I'm not saying you know I've seen anything happen. You know, I don't know if anything happened, but. I would think there should be more of like, for me, a police presence because at night, you know, a lot of people are exiting the train and that's where they're hanging out, you well, know? Well, yeah, I agree. I agree with you, sir. I mean, uh, I wrote down that information. Now that we have a, a transit officers that handle those tra tra train stations, 
um, but the outside we handle. So I'm gonna have a conversation with my commanding officer. I'm gonna pass this information on for him to have a conversation as well with uh, the transit. I'm not gonna lie, sometimes I have to look over my back because I'm afraid to be you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not necessarily afraid. I'm afraid somebody's gonna try to you know, run up on me. Yes, I so understand. So if I'm thinking like that, I can't imagine what other people are thinking, you know? 100%, thank you. Out. Yeah, Jay. Um, I, we had a report at our meeting last night that uh, a young man was held up at gunpoint on Bogai Avenue. They took his uh, clothes and his money. And uh, did you hear? Did you get that report at all? Did you no, know anything about get, that? No. Usually, um, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good with getting information. Yeah, this guy um, was so captain. sure, and I said, that should have been all over the place. Yeah, so I'm, I'm glad I cleared that up. And, that I was have, and, and what we're going to do this year, 2020, again, Al, we're... I notify uh, several people, I would say about the elected officials, their representatives, people on the community board, associations, um, community leaders, community partners, uh, what have you, I, on incidents that happen, uh, email, yeah, I know, email. I, no, I did one last night when I got home late. So I email you guys on that, and that will be something now that I would have yeah, That's why I just figured, that. let me ask. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes a lot of the information, I check with you all the time. Yes. Sometimes a lot of the information we hear that's hearsay is not true. Correct. So when you hear something, check it out before you turn around and start spreading it, because sometimes people will say, oh, this is a serious, I mean, it scared people. The people at the association were up in arms because, in fact, there's a young boy held up at 7 o'clock in the morning at gunpoint. Um, you know. And I, I can I mean this just real quick, thirty seconds, and that's a fantastic point, Al, because what I don't like is people that I've been here twenty years on this department, I've been in community affairs for two since two thousand and six. Everybody here have, has my number. Or somebody if you don't have my number, somebody that knows someone has my number or can get in contact me. And I just don't like when I see things on like social media about information because I guess they feel, people feel that they have a platform, which is fine, that's your right. But if you want accurate information, you don't have to put it on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. You can call me. It's just that simple to clarify anything. So thank you, Al. But we're gonna get more information out uh, regarding uh, um, incidences. Thank you. Yes. All right, Sandy. Can I, I just, can I just touch on that real fast? I, yeah. I just have one question, and I want to thank you guys for doing your job. However, uh -huh. I remember when I grew up, the police walked around every street, every residential area. The kids knew the policemen on the block. Most of the NCOs, they're on the major intersections where the businesses are. But why don't you walk, or I have never seen you walk down any side streets. Right. So and that concerns me. You want to be a presence? I've never seen. We have an NCO Hi, how are you? My name's yeah. Officer Brian Catelli. I'm a NCO for this area. Uh, I'll touch on that, and I'm going to touch on something Jay was uh, talking about. Uh, I feel that I have been. Uh, we do walk around the side streets. We in the parks. We walk around multiple parks. Uh, we do walk around to the businesses. Most of everyone here, I know a lot of people's faces and names. A lot of you have my numbers and uh, email addresses. Um, I don't know how to respond to it because we're out there. Uh, when a complaint comes into us, we go to it. We're walking around. We, uh, we drive around. Um, and I'm going to touch on something that Jay was saying. With social media, there was something that was brought to our attention about a, a car break-in on uh, Hate app. Uh, someone came up from Washington to, to eat dinner, their car bro got broken into, and there was no report made. And then it said, uh, why not reach out to the NCO officers? Uh, first off, our information's online. Uh, people can reach out to us through other people. Uh, a 911 call was made that night, um, and there was a report made. So, like Jay said, there is false information on social media, and why not just reach out to us directly instead of using social media? And Al, in regards to uh, Bogart, I ran the report, and there was nothing. I ran it from last Friday, and Thank I haven't you. seen any report. But, uh, ma'am, you could, what block in specific are you, ma'am? Sandy? Hi. How are you? What, what block in specific are you, do you? What about wearing these 
Oh yeah, that's not my area. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know. I, I take. I'll, I'll tell Sector Boy. We, I take care of Sector Adam. All right. Sorry. It's not. I've seen him around. He's in my. All right. All right. To move on, Linda White. Good evening. Um, I have a complaint about down in Van Ness, Brancatelli. I love you. We've talked a long time ago. We're having a problem down there because 180th Street t train station, Jay, if you remember, it used to be a problem down there. We're starting to get a problem again. There's been robberies in the station as you go in. There's robberies outside the station in that uh, courtyard. People can't park. If you come to park somewhere within, I would say from Melville down, if you come home after 6 o'clock at night, you can't find a place to park. So a lot of people are going to have to park either 180th Street or even as far as East Tremont. It's a very lonely stretch coming up there at night for women and men. And like the gentleman, Mr. Boheen, said, I, I don't go out anymore unless somebody's with me because uh, me and Betsy are not able to get around as best as we used to. So I'm always trying to look over my shoulder. At night, you're putting out the garbage. You, I don't recognize faces. There's faces coming through Van Buren that, and I know, I've been there for 60 some years. I know just about everybody. And we have a problem house in the 1600 block where we have a bunch of uh, sexual offenders. And there's already been problems there. There was a knifing there. 180th Street and Van Ness, there's always shots. There was somebody shot there not too long ago. Can you help us, please? Because that lower end, we're starting to, f to feel a little uncomfortable. I'll touch on the, uh, the transit issue. Uh, like Jay said, transit takes care of transit. So they're inside that. Uh, we do drive around, though, Van Est area. Uh, we are in there quite often. We do go up and down the, the dead end streets. Um, I know there is some illegal activity that I heard goes on. It's a bit hard to catch them in the act when you have a, a big SUV. Uh, but we purposely do go down there, especially with our lights on, uh, to deter them. It's the winter, it's been a little bit better. Um, and our presence, I uh, hopefully just, it, it deters them. Uh, besides that, you know, there's no other way for them, you know, for us to actually prevent the crime, hopefully them seeing us. And we do post up, uh, we have sector autos. So if something, uh, if there's a specific location, we tell them to, to post up there so they could be there for an hour at a time, you know, just keep their lights on and, and deter the crime for that time being. The, we hear the shots, we haven't heard shots in a long time. We're starting to hear the shots from, Van, from uh, 108th and Van Est and Adams and Van Est. So just to point it out to you. Okay, great. Um, so final question or statement, whatever it is. This is not a question, it's a statement. First of all, I want to thank you for doing the job that you do. And Jay, I don't sleep at night with some of the emails that you send. Okay. The, 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 the problem here is it's not the fact that the NCO offices are not in the areas. The problem is here that they're not visible. Driving a car through a block doesn't mean anything because these people that are doing these offenses know the cop is going to leave in two minutes. We need walking patrol. We need the bicycles back because that was very effective. The bikes rode around the area and the people saw the, the offices on the bikes in the Leary. Yeah. Take light again, you it's a disaster area in front of that liquor store. And I know the MCOs are watching, and I know what's going on there. My window's face there. I wouldn't want my child to walk down that block. Well, I'm happy to say that in, when the nicer weathers uh, come along, we're, we will have the bicycle units back. The bicycles will be in services, service, service now. And we are, the captain is putting together a little team to, to, to bring that back. But they can't ride the bikes now in the cold weather. But definitely we are aware of what's happening, Edith, over there on Lighting. We really do. Trust me, we have a good handle on that. Um, but it's just, I know it's a sight, and it's not a nice sight. But, um, you know, we, we're going to continue to do our enforcement there and do everything that we can to continue that, to make sure that it's safe over there. Great. Great. 
Okay. All right, moving on. We're going to go to the gallery session. Thank you, uh, members of the NYPD. Very good, guys. Yeah, for now. Gallery session, one minute because of the length of time of this meeting. So you only have one minute. And if you don't like that, I'm sorry, you're going to have to complain to those two elected officials that took up most of the time, right? Um, all right, so uh, as, as people are, some people are aware or not, remember you got to sign a gallery slip at the beginning before the meeting starts to speak. So we have seven speakers. Um, uh, we have, and whenever we have more than one person speaking on a subject, we always group those people together. So I'm going to ask uh, the two people speaking on behalf of the Curvins, um, come up together. Uh, that would be Marisa Davis and Raphael Schweitzer. I defer all my time to Marissa. Thank you. Um, good evening. I'm the owner of Curbin's Bar and I'm looking to expend my hours to 4 a.m. I would like to garner more of the market share like our neighboring bars in Morris Park. Um, and I feel that I haven't displayed any patterns of consistent behavior that should impede that. We're a neighborhood bar with blue collar workers and a lot of civil servicemen. I took a chance and invested in the community I've lived in for over 15 years and I'm simply trying to thrive. I pay the highest rent on Lydig and opening at 3 p.m. gives me limited hours for gross intake. Our license was renewed a month ago with no objections by the precinct who had an option at that time and also the board. However, we were denied last week to extend our hours based on two calls in January. I would respectfully like to correct the record regarding incorrect statements made at the last meeting after I left the room, um, which were part of the denial. The newer lieutenant stated that I have not helped the police and I don't take steps asked of me as an owner. We've been helpful on many, many occasions to detectives seeking help on disturbances not related to the bar under the past and current command, many times. That's it. Sorry, that, that was a minute. Um, yeah, let her get a little more time just for the fish. What's up? Does the board yeah, allow to extend? No. Let her finish the statement. I'm here in the majority. Thank you. Um, One minute. We have helped on many occasions. I've installed floodlights, window bars, and increased security cameras as requested by the 4-9. Um, it was also stated that one of the two calls, we didn't open the gate and cooperate. I'd like the record to reflect. I showed proof on arrival of text with my AV specialist trying to get the newly added cameras outside fixed the week prior without any ability to see outside, locking the gate that's opaque for the guest safety inside. I didn't know anyone was knocking outside, especially the police on New Year's Eve. Um, it was also stated that no bars in Community Board 11 have been open until 4 a.m. I would like the record to reflect the pool hall and Gasolina have been open until 4 a.m. Um, I'm simply trying to do socioeconomic development in the neighborhood, and it starts with bars and restaurants. Williamsburg, Red Hook, Harlem, Dykeman, the best neighborhoods in the city have bars and restaurants. And the board should reflect on the community's voices. My petition to open had over 500 signatures when I went to the SLA. I simply want to grow and thrive. Um, having security and wanting to increase it is being a responsible owner, and I don't want that to also impede me. That's two minutes. Okay. No questions? Uh, no, I don't see any questions, but thank you. Um, uh, no beer, Gene DeFrancis. <laughs> oh, Jesus, I didn't recognize you. <laughs> right? Thanks. Um, I thought you said no bid, Gene no. DeFrancis, for no, a no. second. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'm, I'm information overload right now. There was so much. Uh, Sands is closing. That's pretty much it. The top floor. Really? They're on the lease. Thank you, Business Improvement District, for not listening to us. Have a great day. Okay. Um, next uh, gallery session speaker, Grace Lavaglia, regarding bail reform. Good <laughs> <laughs> evening, everyone. Happy New Year. I just wanted to, I didn't know Darcel was going to be here. 
So she basically talked about bail reform. But just to piggyback on that, I just wanted to make, I mean, I'm sure you're all aware that it, this bail reform just makes the job of our police officers much harder. Darcel may be fighting crime with one hand behind your back, but this is putting our officers two hands behind their backs. So we really need to consider when it's time to reelect the people that thought this was a good idea to really consider not to reelect them and vote for anybody but those people. For example, Cuomo is holding the bail reform hostage, I believe, unless he gets his budget passed. So he's, been, he's using extortion as well. We really need to consider these people that have been put in office. And thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, Leslie Froberg, U.S. Census. Hi. I'm from the recruiting part of the U.S. Census, and I just came here to let people know that we are hiring. We're looking for census takers. The pay is currently $28 per hour. People can work between, <laughs> between 10 and 40 hours per week, days, nights, or weekends. Um, and after 6 o'clock is a nighttime differential, which will bring it to about $34 per hour. Sundays is also a differential, which will bring it about $34 per hour. We are seeking, all you have to do is go online to 2020census.gov slash jobs. Now the $28 per hour is in the five boroughs. Outside of New York City, they get paid less, but we're paying $28 per hour here. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Uh, Brody Kimraj regarding the new MTA website. Hi, everyone. I'm Brody Kimraj, and I will be handling the community outreach for the four Metro North stations that are coming to the Bronx. If you have any questions, please let me know. I'm going to be here. I have this sign-in sheet for anyone who wants to be on our community outreach list. If you're on any other list, I really don't uh, know about those lists. So add your name and email address here so you'll get up-to-date information. And we'll ask uh, Jeremy and the chair and the board of which board member wants to be on this list specifically with MTA. It's a new website that was launched um, giving you up-to-date information about the stations. And we're going to be at the committee meeting on February 10th with Board 11 where we're going to be giving a full presentation on the update of the station that is specifically coming in this area. Thank you. I'm just letting you know about the launch of the website, but the, if you come to the committee meeting, it'll be full details. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, and last but not least, Vinnie Marie Leon regarding PS 108 and X. Are we granting them two minutes to? It's just one, it's one person. Hi, my name is Vinnie Marie. Um, as parents and family members of students at PS 108, we were notified that PS 108 will be acquiring an annex building. Um, the project is to begin this summer, spring of 2020. It is a concern among us that currently the school is only K through five. Um, we are hoping that with the addition of this annex, PS 108 can accommodate students up to the eighth grade. Families are proud to have their children attend this school, but find themselves out of options after fifth grade. And therefore, many are forced to relocate and move out of the area. Um, having 108 go up to the 8th grade will help retain our students and residents here in Mars Park and have the opportunity to continue educating our children at PS 108. We've asked various faculties at the school and no, everyone says the same thing, we don't know. So for families, it's good to plan where we're going after 5th grade and like I said, a lot of us are moving out of the area because there's no quality middle school. Um, and the other thing is, I am aware that PS 108's enrollment has been on the decline, and this is one of the issues. Is, is there a, is there some kind of a plan to go K to eight? We and don't know. Every Which, time we ask, it's obviously the parents want to go K to eight. What's the principal That's feel about it? Same thing. Don't know. But does he does he want to go K to eight? We don't know. Every time we address it, take it up with the officials. That's the response that we get. Uh, get in touch with me at the community board and. I would like to see that school go K-8, so okay. we'll see what we can do as a community. Thank you. Okay, um, so that ends the gallery session. We'll move on to elected officials, uh, for our president's office. Good evening, everyone. 
but he's going to mention Just a couple of uh, quick yeah, items. Uh, first of all, for all those who are up for reappointment, I remind you once again, I sent an email out yesterday that your applications are due on February the 7th. In addition, those, uh, excuse me, all board members are required to complete their sexual harassment training course. For those members that are up for reappointment and do not take that course, uh, our, our office will not consider your reapplication. So if you have not taken that course, please get in touch with Jeremy. Uh, there are honestly only a few members, I think, in Board 11 who have not taken it. Uh, so for those who haven't, please get in touch with Jeremy. Uh, two quick items um, in terms of events. Uh, the Department of City Planning is having a training session for land use uh, on land use issues on Monday night. I know Jeremy has sent it out. I've sent it out to anybody who's interested. It is at um, Metropolitan Community College. Please, uh, I left some flyers in the back. If you're interested, please RSVP. And then finally, tomorrow, uh, there's a nonprofit incorporation and tax exemption workshop for 501c3s who have questions regarding tax exemption that the Attorney General and the Borough President are co-sponsoring at Hostos tomorrow morning at 9 uh, at the Hostos Cafe building at 8, uh, excuse me, 450 Grand Concourse. And just finally, um, the Borough President did put out a report recently regarding pathways to home ownership to one of the questions that was brought to the Congresswoman. Um, the Borough President is uh, the report talks about how the city should encourage developers to create more home ownership possibilities, whether it's individual two-family homes, co-ops, and condos. The full report is available on our website. Thank you. Councilmember Jonah's office. Hi, I'll try to keep it brief. I'm Farah Rubin from Councilman Jonai's office. Happy New Year. Uh, we would like to mention all the free services that our office tries to provide for the community. We have immigration services, free housing services, legal assistance. We also have free social services. You just have to call our office to make an appointment. Also, a few events we have coming up. We have the MetroCard mobile van coming to Mars Park Library January 30th. I'm sorry, January 29th from 10 to 12. And we also have a job fair at the Bronx House on January 30th. You just have to call our office to RSVP if you want to bring your resume or if you want to be a participant. That's from 5 to 8 p.m. We also have free tax prep twice a week in our office starting this month. So again, just RSVP at our office. Um, we're also uh, with the ban of single-use plastic bags coming in March, we are giving away free tote bags in our office. You just have to stop by and we'll give you a free tote bag. Thank you very much. Okay, um, Council Member Torres' office. <laughs> when I worked out in Illinois, the guy says, is a one in New York minute, 30 seconds? I said, yeah, so give me a minute and a half. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. My name is Joseph McManus. I know uh, I've been on the community board for 16 years, but I see a lot of new members, so I just wanted to reintroduce myself. And somebody through a third party says, what is his title? The title is Senior Advisor, as in wisdom, not in for old people like me. <laughs> Uh, but I just wanted to mention, I'm, I'm going to try and be as short as I can. One of the bills that was up uh, that the councilman is the lead sponsor in is this cashless ban bill which passed today. So that means businesses that supply food, or I, I should say any brick and mortar retail business that supplies services, foods, clothes, stuff like that, must accept cash. And when I talked to the councilman, we had a conversation a <coughs> few months ago. I said, well, it says on the dollar bill, this is, this is legal tender for all that's public and private. And another thing, me being a little bit older, I'm very cautious about uh, identity theft. The more times you pass a credit card, or especially a debit card, it's a, it's a real issue. So uh, that bill passed today overwhelmingly. The mayor said he was going to look at uh, signing it. Uh, the other thing, I left some flyers out, but one fly I don't have is we are doing tax prep uh, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. 
but you have to call the office at 718-842-8100. Thank you, and have a nice month. Joe, Thank what, you. One question, Joe. I charge for questions, Frank. Very good. Some stores are charging a 4, four or 5 percent fee for using credit cards and they have don't have it posted. Have Is that legal? I don't know every law. I would assume that that doesn't sound kosher to me, but uh, <coughs> I will bring it back and I'll find out, okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Councilmember King's office. Thank you. Uh, many of you know me. My name is Robert Press. I am fully experienced on community boards. I was on community board eight for over six years and affiliated with it for about 20 years before that. I was vice chair of traffic and transportation, vice chair of public safety, and chair of its budget committee, where I met Jeremy one year at budget negotiations. Uh, I'm just going to go through because I don't want to take too much time, but I do want this board to know that the council members, the three council members, are board members and should be sitting up front with you members. All right, Councilman King has uh, got a New York City Green Jobs Corporate Corps in the chef that's over at the table. Also, Councilman King is doing uh, tax free tax service, which is at the table. But you all, again, like the other members, you have to be in the district. And on Wednesday, January 29th, Councilman King is holding a town hall meeting as far as why the tower fell down with the globe on it. Now, with my expertise in land use, I can tell you that that tower was rushed in because Community Board 10 was about to change the zoning regulations. They were going from C7, which was from Freedom Land, to a C82. What that meant is that tower could still be built, but it had to be built on top of the building. It also allowed for a community facility. And with this town hall is Congressman Elliot Engel, Senator Jamal Bailey, Assemblyman Benedetto, uh, we'll join, are scheduled to join Councilman King, and we're going to find out why that tower fell. Thank you. Um, um, public Advocate Jemani Williams, his office. Sorry, you said I have one minute? Two. two. Oh, I have two minutes. Okay, great. Good evening, everybody. Oh, wow. I'm sorry about that. Good evening, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good, good. Nah, I got a little bit more energy than that. How's everybody doing? Yeah. Yeah. It's, too late. it's too late for now. I'm sorry. Happy New Year, everyone. My name is Brian Polanco. I'm from the Office of the Public Advocate. I'm part of this new borough advocacy unit. So what does that mean? That essentially means that there's a point person in every borough of the Bronx, of, sorry, of the city. I'm the point person for the Bronx. Now, just to get some important details out the way, we have a whole unit dedicated to constituent services. And the phone number for constituent services is 212-669-7250. Again, 212-669-7250. The email for constituent services is gethelp at advocate.nyc.gov. Again, gethelp at advocate.nyc.gov. And if there's any events you want me to be aware of, so I can just forward it to our office, my email is bpolanco, so that's B-P-O-L-A-N-C-O at advocate.nyc.gov. Um, and that just concludes my report. I'm just trying to keep it brief for in the interest of time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Biagi's office. College, 6.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. The second announcement is that I have no form pamphlets if anyone wants to learn about the new laws that just passed January 1st. Do I have any questions? No. Thank you very much. One yep. oh, go ahead. I, I am. Uh, you should bring back the message that these reforms are going to affect her constituents, especially uh, these uh, releases and uh, <laughs> incarcerations all over. She was part of it, she voted. Let her know that we're not happy. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> okay. Uh, Christian Amato. 
Oh, sorry. Um, is that number two? Oh, okay, I don't know where two went. But. Oh, okay, there it is. All right, go ahead. Hello? Okay, great. Um, I know that the Senate just passed a bill last session that makes it uh, illegal for landlords to take security deposits. Um, and I'm curious if you know how that is being enforced, um, because I know there's a lot of buildings in the community that are still charging security deposits for their apartments. I have no idea, but I'll bring that back to our team and I'll bring it back to you. Do you want me to share that with you on email? Okay. You can send it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Senator Rivera's office. Senator Rivera. We'll stop. Turn around. <laughs> Come on, Caitlin, come on. You're on a clock. Okay. I'll talk about it, but I'll double high announcements. Um, so, as I believe Emily mentioned, we are part of the Bronx Delegation Budget Forum happening on January 30th. The flyers are up front. Also, all the bus routes in the Bronx are being changed, which means your stop might be removed. So, I highly recommend that you check out what's going on. If you see a problem with it, the Senator is hosting a town hall on Saturday, February 1st. I also have flyers for those up front. Now what you were talking about, I think, is the law that was passed last session, correct? Yeah. Um, so security deposits, you can only pay one month's rent now. The enforcement is kind of shady a little bit because there's not really an oversight. Um, a lot of times, you know, if you say, I'm not gonna pay more than that, they'll just not give you the apartment. So what we've been doing is we recommend you take the landlord to small claims afterwards. Good. Any Thank more you. questions? Good night. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Senator Bailey's office. Hi, my name is Renell from Senator um, Jamal T. Bailey's office. Happy New Year and um, good evening. So Senator Bailey, um, he has our health insurance enrollment event. Um, tomorrow's the last day, so if you know of anybody that needs to enroll for health insurance, the deadline is January 31st. So I have more of these flyers on the table. If you know anyone that needs health insurance, they can call this number 212-331-6266. Um, there's also more flyers in the back. Um, I also have the same um, pamphlet as um, the previous representative. Um, this pamphlet, I think, will help clear up some misconceptions that people have about criminal justice reform. Um, just, if you have the time, before you leave, you could take any of our packets and just read it through. Thank you. Right. Tony? Yes. Hold, hold it. Hold it. Hello. Attention. Is it on? No, no, no. Hello. It's a green. Hello. Hello. Yeah. All right. The same message uh, Frano gave to Senator Biagi. I'm giving to you for Bailey about the review of this law, which he was part and parcel of passing. Thank you. All right, I'll let him know. Okay. Um, last but not least, Assemblymember Fernandez is in office. Ain't no more elected officials after that, right? Good evening, everybody. I'm Floor Hutt from Assemblywoman Fernandez's office. Hope everybody's doing well. I for hospital. Not forehand. I heard somebody say that. <laughs> Just a couple of uh, quick announcements. So I'm sure many of you have heard that Puerto Rico has been hit with a couple of earthquakes over the past uh, few weeks. So us, alongside uh, Assemblyman Carina Cerez, which is uh, who represents like the Parkchester area, we're doing a relief drive. So canned goods, bottled water, diapers, tents, batteries. Uh, there's flyers on the table for you guys. Unfortunately, uh, we've already been doing it for about a week and a half now, so tomorrow is the last day for drop-off. Uh, we're going to be dropping everything off at 1 p.m., so if you guys can drop them off at our office, whatever you guys can give, that would be greatly appreciated. Also, we got a couple of census events that we are working on. Uh, dates are still working out, uh, but it's going to be in February. Uh, we're playing around February 17th, but obviously, you know, we will send an email to the board as soon as that's figured out, and you can always follow us on social media for that information as well. And finally, on the bus route change, all uh, express bus routes, uh, any changes to that have been stalled until 2021. So I know there's a lot of concern, maybe not in this area, but in our Norwood section. There's been some concerns about express bus route changes. So currently, there none of that stuff will happen. 
uh, in just terms of Express Bus. And if anybody has any questions? Dom Chiano. Yeah, hi. Hey. Uh, what they're doing for Puerto Rico, I feel is very important. But one thing that I saw on TV not too long ago is that we sent aid over there during the hurricane and there was this enormous warehouse loaded with stuff that wasn't distributed. I mean, you're collecting all of this stuff. What are you doing to make sure that it gets to the actual people that need it? So the individuals hosting the giveaway part, uh, that their point CDC and their very great organizations have worked with them in the past, as well as Son uh, Nos Tardamos, I think. Don't quote me on the name, but everything is on that flyer. And we've double checked with the provider who's going to be dropping off in Puerto Rico to make sure that they were not one of those individuals who had those warehouses. So we're covering our ground on that, making sure that supplies aren't held for any kind of reason whatsoever. We want to save the people who need it actually get it. Of course. Right, of course. Any other questions? Also, just uh, let uh, Natalia Fernandez know that we're not happy with the vote on bail reform. Uh, and I think they should revisit it. I want to call Hazy because I know he's right now stopping any more discussion on it uh, to open it up to, you know, as you heard the um, district attorney this evening, some of the things that she said were, you know, were something that we need to make sure that the community stays safe. I will the message. And um, I know it's a short thing, sorry, to, I don't know if I have any more time, about the bill. I don't know if you want me to speak on it right now. It's up to you. Okay, so I'm sure the board obviously knows about the bill uh, regarding advance notification for any individuals applying for to Oasis for chemical dependence facilities. Uh, and so initially 30 days, and that's been introduced, that is a bill now, and I have the bill number actually, uh, A8912, so you guys can look that up. We're still playing around with committee, you know, these things take a while. So I know a lot of people are, you know, losing a bit of patience. I just ask you guys to keep working with us. It's gonna take a bit of time to get this right. But I do know a vote was made to extend that to 60 days. So, and we're aware of it, you know, got the email, so we're gonna be taking a look at it. We're still speaking with the committee head, Linda Rosenthal, to see what we can do. So just letting you guys know that's where that stands. As soon as, you know, more information comes out, I'll obviously email Jeremy, and hopefully we can get that sorted. Thank you. This is it. Yeah, Joe. Microphone, please. Um, has, there been, has there been any other updates with Oasis and any other application or any other interest anywhere else in the community? No. Hmm? All right, thank you very much. Uh, so that concludes the elected officials portion. We'll turn it over to Albert D'Angelo, Chairman, Committee Number 11. Good evening. Uh, first motion to approve the uh, November 2019 minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay. Um, just a, a few a few items. One, attendance at meetings. Uh, if you're on the board and you're you're designated to be on a committee, please make sure you go to the committee's meetings. If you can't make them, let me know. If you can't make them consistently, let me know. I'll take you off that committee and put you on another. Because what's happening is people have had four meetings last week, three of them, no quorum. And that's, you know, people come out in the evenings to go to, you know, take time off from work, take time off from their families, come to a meeting, and then two people don't show up and don't call and, you know, the meeting is held and nothing can be, no business can be uh, done because there is no quorum. So something has to be done about that. So please, you know, if there's a problem, let us know. If there's, if there's a problem where you can't be there, let me know, I will change the committee. Also remember, there are five meetings. If you miss five meetings, that's meetings here or meetings on your uh, committees, you're brought up before the board to explain why, or we send a letter asking to, you to be removed from the board. You know, we did it last year, but the board, the board will make the, the final vote. All right, so please, I mean, it's just a courtesy to the other members of the board. Meeting agendas, when you have a, uh, if you're gonna have a meeting, please have the agenda in about a week before, if possible, so Jeremy can put it out there so people can see what's going on if they wish to attend. Um, also, I, I have set up a, an ad hoc committee for ethics and discipline committee. Uh, I asked uh, Yahe, Yahe Oben uh, to, to chair it, uh, Ellie Rodriguez and Edith Shkrelik to uh, be on the committee, they said they would. So if anything comes up that needs to be discussed, they will handle it first. It saves us from going downtown and dealing with it through the borough president's office. We can deal with it in-house, especially if it's a minor, uh, minor incident that can be handled you know, fairly simply. 
Now, the other thing is, at the end of this meeting, we're going to go into executive session on a personnel uh, matter. So I would ask everybody to please hang around. It won't take long. Uh, but, you know, again, at the end of this meeting, we'll go into executive session, and uh, it should take maybe about five minutes. Tom? You're, you're not ending the meeting. <coughs> I'm not ending the meeting. I'm just going in. Yeah, yeah, I'm just going. The last item on the agenda would be. Right, the last item on the agenda is going into executive session, and we'll come back to, uh, you know, to, to adjourn the meeting. Um, that's it. Uh, I ask you when you give your reports this evening, if you just, if it's good, don't read the minutes for us. Tell us the minutes are in your, uh, in your packet so we can read them. Uh, so we're trying to keep these meetings as brief as possible. We're pushing to get out of here by ten. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to start my report, Bob, by turning over to our public safety chairman, um, Yahe Obi. Oh, sorry, sorry, get ahead of myself. Uh, Veronica, where are you? The report is in your package. If you have any questions, see me after the meeting. Thank you. So as I was saying, I'm going to turn this over to Yahe Obi, public safety. All right, hello everyone. You've uh, all got any uh, public safety uh, survey? Please fill it out. We need as much uh, input as uh, possible so we can analyze and prioritize what's going on in the district. Uh, we know that you can't attend our meetings. I can't attend your committee meetings. So this is a good idea for us to get input from our, our uh, committee committees, actually, for uh, the transportation committee. I have a lot of stuff about transportation. I can't make it to the committee meetings, but if they can take my input, that would be great. So this is something that we're trying. Please give us your input. It would really uh, help us out. Um, and again, the last thing I'll say, it will be expanded to the public. So we're starting with just community board members. We'll get your input, and then we're gonna expand the survey to the public so we can get the public's input. Thank you very much. Yes, pass, pass, pass it to me. I, I've only gotten half of uh, the survey, so I need about 15 more, please. Thank you. Okay, and in terms of my report, what actually needs to be verbally stated, um, I want to apologize, the health should have been in the packets. I don't know why they're not. I'll follow up on that tomorrow. Website and bio pictures. Uh, Paula Career here is going to be taking pictures of certain board members who wanted a uh, picture with their bio on our website. She's also going to help uh, people like Janice Walsh Walcott get a bio, uh, Daisy Rodriguez. And um, Susan's place on Jerome Avenue, that's a homeless shelter. It's, it's written in the packet. Um, the health committee will have a meeting on this next month. Please see me after the meeting to have questions. Parliamentary procedures. So all these economic development committee meeting motions as well as the land use motion, they were voted on committee. Just remember, you don't have to second that. The motion can go straight to the floor because it was voted on committee. Um, budget priorities in the packet. Recycling and composting at the CB11 office. I have to mention this at my DSC meetings. Unfortunately, I end up going through the trash to pull out people's uh, improperly disposed of trash and recyclables, whether it's improperly in the, the compost, the recycling, or the garbage. Please remember we recycle and we compost at the office. We try to be model citizens, so please keep that in mind. If you don't know, you have a question on what's recyclable, what's not, the staff is very good about asking me that stuff. Plastic bag band, it's in the, the packet, Yankee Awards. It's, it's not on my written report, I just hadn't had time to write, write it. It simply said, Yankees reached out to us, we gave them what we have, but they have not approved it yet, so I'm not notifying any um, buddy of receiving or not getting the award yet. And so I get back from them. Reminder, American flags. Uh, we have, thanks to city council funding last year, we have American flags in our office still. If you're a, a resident of CB11 and you would like an American flag, a three by foot, five foot American flag with a metal bracket and a plastic pole, stop by the office. We'll happily give them to you. So I think that's good enough for my report, and we will turn it over to um, leadership, Tony Vitaliano. Good evening, and welcome back. Uh, we met the, on the last Thursday. We voted, uh, we uh, asked a, uh, uh, a calendar, which is in your uh, envelopes, okay? And the minutes of that meeting will be available at the board, correct, Chairman? We taped it, didn't we? Yeah, it's taped. Okay. Yeah. And that's it. Thank you. Economic Development, Joanne Rubino. Microphone. Joe Menta, pass it, please. 
I'll try to be brief, although there's a lot of stuff that went on at this meeting. Um, we had five, um, we have four renewals and five new uh, uh, requests for a liquor license. Um, what our esteemed chairperson has decided, and I think it's a good idea, is to put us into teams. That's why I'm presenting tonight into four teams. Uh, we were a team, Shroud and I were team number one, and our uh, job was to go out to each of the uh, businesses and see if what they said was true about you know because all of them said that they were you know complying with everything and for the most part for the most part it was there were some misunderstandings but for them for the renewals and, and well there's a new which I would discuss separately for the new uh, for the renewals um, I think there was a a misunderstanding with the egress uh, some of the businesses didn't have that understanding so I think we have to work closely with them but there every one of them at correct me, every one of them was very willing to correct any problem that there was what it was basically the push bar uh, the direction that the door opened people very experienced the renewals and they said that it's an easy thing to overcome. So I wanted to uh, put all four. Uh, there were Lynn's Restaurant, um, Liberty Diner, Luke's Lounge, and um, oh, oh, wait, 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 wait. Luke's Lounge, Liberty Diner, and I'm wrong. And, and well, no, the Golden Corral, that was the new. And also, not on here, uh, is the Sunset Cafe, which uh, is on East Chester Road, which I'm going to discuss also. And that was new. The uh, Sunset Cafe is going to open tomorrow. The Golden Corral is not going is is going to open in March. Uh, based on our conversations at the meeting, we feel that we can approve their liquor licenses. Uh, the uh, I went I actually Charo I went today to the Sunset Cafe, and everything seems pretty much you know you know pretty good. I mean, again with the egress, is that something we we have to discuss? Uh, and like I said, they're perfectly willing to do it. So I'd like to make uh, I'd, I'd like to make a motion to approve all four um, liquor licenses. That would be uh, Lynn's, Liberty Diner, Luke's Lounge, and the Sunset Cafe, which is not on here. Um, uh, to send an email of no objection for their liquor license. Now, do I have to? Do, I, you I don't second. have to second it. I second it. You second. Yeah. It. Okay. All right. Um, Open for discussion? Yeah. Sure. The Sunset Cafe is right next to the Urgent Care on East Chester Road uh, by Aster. Okay. And okay. welcome to the neighborhood. It seems like a pretty good business. David okay. Levin? Yes. First of all, I think it's inappropriate to put all of those into one motion. Okay. Second of all, did it come up in your meeting about Luke's Lounge? that they're in violation of their sidewalk cafe permit. They there, currently have a the Department of Buildings violation for having an illegal enclosure. Okay. Did any of that come up? No, well what they what they told us when we went that they are applying for the um, the outside no, that did not come up actually. It did not come up. It wasn't in the file. It wasn't in the file. And you didn't no. ask? No, and no, it wasn't in the file. And I don't know, Joe, if you want to address that. There's something that you. Luke's lounge. Oh, okay. I know the board has looked at this uh, Luke's lounge before, and I know that that's an issue. And uh, I think uh, as uh, as the board left it was that yeah. Uh, they have to cut it down, and they intend to cut it down. Um, when we went there, uh, they, they are, they're applying for a, um, a sidewalk cafe. They're applying, and they expect in the, in the month to be approved. That's what they told me. Okay. All right, so we'll revisit that. So you're tabling it? No, no, I'm going to approve it. I'm going to make a motion to approve it. You're going to do it all in one motion, all of those? In yes, one motion. in one motion. Even though the Vice President's <laughs> office advised that we not do that. It was in the parliamentary material that was given out that we not combine all those motions into one. Okay, then we'll do it separately. 
because we'd like to comply. Okay. Okay. So we'll do it separately. I'd also like to ask if the district manager has anything to to say on the um, the Department of Buildings complaint and the violation and the DCA so, so the, lounge and what was in the file. Yeah. So the DCA, um, as far as I remember, in November came back. They were in compliance. Although we've had historically a problems with this place in the past in terms of the sidewalk cafe permit, um, but the most recent inspection they, they passed but the department of buildings yes they got violated i believe it's a five thousand dollar fine or two thousand two to five thousand dollar fine for that and so i think what joanne you're trying to say is that they are trying to they're trying to they're trying to make, make amends and legalize it yes exactly they seem very uh very motivated to do whatever it is to stay in business they've been in business for eight years and they want to stay in business so i think they'll do anything they can but i think i think also a Point that David's making, mm -hmm. maybe not outright, but implied is that these things should be in the file, and, and so in the future, I think that that's a good point that that should be in the okay. file. Um, De Debbie, call up first, and then yep. we can take turns. I think voting on that one should be separate because if they have a well, history. Of they're all problems. separate. They're all being voted separately. They're all going to be voted. Mike from the down champ, please. Yeah, hi. The enclosed cafe or the outside cafe, whatever it is. In other words, they're not going to rectify the problem because they're applying for it. But meantime, it's all illegal. I mean, shouldn't they get rid of that first, make the application for it? Because there's no guarantee they're going to get it. So in the meantime, they're still operating like that. I don't, I mean, that's something that I wouldn't approve. So, let's put it on the floor. Joe, do you? Take a vote. Let's take a vote. As a reasonable approach, as a reasonable approach. This is something that we've been dealing with. For how long have we been dealing with Loops Lounge? This is the second year in a row that put up the illegal enclosure. Right. They have a they have a sidewalk cafe permit for two tables and four, four chairs. chairs. They have something like ten tables and twenty-four chairs in an illegal enclosure. That place is a powder keg. And you know it. It's on a side street and there have been incidents there before under a different owner, but it is a very tight space. And they put up that illegal enclosure two years in a row. And I am just shocked that you are putting them forward to be approved. Well, one of the reasons is that we had no police report on uh, Luke's Lounge. We had no uh, police violations on the Luke's Lounge. Now, I've seen the place. I've seen it from the outside. Uh, our team went and uh, they spoke to the ownership. They looked at the place. Um, we don't have a history of any kind of violation or any kind of violence uh, from Luke's Lounge. Now, yeah, we could deny them and we could put this business out of order for a couple of years. Um, but I think that if they're going to comply and they have stated they would comply with this and are making efforts to do so, and our chair, uh, not our chair, but our uh, a district manager went by there also. Uh, I don't see closing them down uh, for two years while we uh, play with this. Now, had they committed something that's violent, had they made uh, some kind of um, uh, disqualifying police incident, yeah, I would close them down. But so far, I've heard nothing about their clientele. I've heard nothing about uh, breaking the laws, um, except that they have extra tables outside. So I don't see how closing a business for two years for something like that. Hey, Albert D'Angelo, if you don't yeah, mind, I've and then David. I've gone in there numerous times just to uh, one time because of the uh, chairs outside. They removed them, they put them back inside. Um, since they, the new owners took over the place, there's been no problems in that place at all. You're right, David, there were numerous problems before this gentleman took over. 
gentleman or lady, I'm not sure who owns it, but whoever took it over, it's it's packed every day because I walk past it uh, on the way to work on Saturdays. The place is packed, never a problem. I went in there to talk to him about illegal park cars because that's a problem in the community. He said he's told the police and he told the people that are in there if they're double parked outside, they're going to get tickets. And he told the police, <coughs> ticket them. In fact, he's called the police himself to ticket the cars outside when the neighbors are complaining. So, again, I think he's got to uh, comply, and if he's promised to comply, yeah, I'm yeah, fine to give him a chance. Um, David, or do you want to defer to Christian? Go ahead. I've talked to a lot of people on that block, um, and besides the fact that traffic is always atrocious, in that area, um, and people are always illegally parked. I think there's a bigger element to this establishment than what's on paper, and that's the feeling that it has left in the community. And there are people on that block who are afraid to say anything negative about that business out of fear of retaliation. And there are people on that block who don't want to cause any fights because they've been threatened. And so when we think about approving a business, I don't think that and it could be new owners and they may not be the ones making threats but when we are looking at a business like this we can't allow a business that is causing people in the neighboring community to feel unsafe to continue to operate um, under standard procedure so sure tons of times that you visited you may think that things are on the up and up but it seems that there's elements to this business that you're not being informed of and that they're keeping, you know, hidden from us. And when we keep that in mind, I think there's a lot of important other factors that come into play when making this decision. I live a block I live a block away. I haven't heard one and again with the Park Park Community Association, I haven't heard one I haven't heard one complaint about the place, to tell you the truth. You know, that's I mean Joe Thompson. I I appreciate what you say. But we have the same problem listening to what you said as listening to what they say. Because you're, you're making a blanket statement. If you want to make a statement like that, then I'm afraid you're going to have to back that up with something. Not just, uh, I heard, I heard, I heard. I heard it from, I heard it from XYZ at XYZ. Now, with those kind of uh, accusations, um, you do know, have to back that up with something. And if you have something, that's fine. We'll listen. Go ahead. Uh, if I were able to get those people to come to the community board, would we be interested in tabling this discussion, talking about it with them, and then moving forward at a later date on this? I'll tell you what, I'll go you one better. I'll go with you and I'll listen for myself. And if that's the case, I'll definitely uh, stop it. Or attempt to stop it. I mean, it's a vote. Okay? So, Joe Cable, please. Linda, Linda, Linda. So, Linda. Linda White. Since there's so much discussion on this particular motion, is there any harm in tabling it? Because SLA doesn't always listen to what we say anyway. So I'm being totally honest. We all know that there's been times when we don't want something and SLA goes through with it. Is there any harm in tabling it at this particular time until it's looked into further and then bringing it up again instead of beating a dead horse? So let me just rephrase that if you don't mind. Is the committee opposed to tabling it? No. No? No? All right, so then it's table. Well, well, yeah, but tabling it for what? I, I, I'd like to table yeah. it pending uh, an investigation of the community. Also, a month will give us a chance to see if they are actually doing what they say they're, they're, they're wanting to, to do. So, yeah, I have no problem with tabling this for a month. Uh, and so we take a look at it until we find out if they're actually making moves in that direction. You don't have to make very many moves. All you have to do is remove four tables and uh, as, a, as a move and the enclosure. 
Well, the enclosure comes along with the. I'll have to check that one out. I'll have to check out the enclosure. But uh, I will check out the neighborhood. I will go with Chris, and we will talk to some of the people he's talked to, and we will find out if uh, if they're actually complying as far as their license is concerned. So. Okay. Buildings license, yeah. the DCA license. All right, hold on. Dom Shannon had his hand up. Dom Shannon, please make it quick. Yeah, I'd like to make a suggestion. We table it and put it on the agenda for next month's meeting. Yeah, do it. Okay. Yeah. Second by the agenda. Yeah, okay. All right. All right. Um, the mo I second the motion. Okay. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any against? Abstentions? Unanimous. Great. Uh, Joanne, are you continuing? Lynn's Garden Restaurant, we found absolutely no problems. Uh, we would like to send, uh, have a motion to send an email of no objection to the New York State Liquor Authority regarding this establishment. I second. So it's a vote of favor. Discussion. All in favor? Oh, discussion? discussion? Discussion. Okay. You left out Golden Corral. No, I'm not. I will at the end. One, one at a time. Okay, one at a time. All in favor? Right. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Abstentions. Any abstentions? One, one extension. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Next is Liberty Diner. Uh, also, everything was was very good. Um, I'd like to send an email of no objection to the uh, SLA regarding this establishment. Oh, second. Okay. Uh, Aye. Aye. And discussion? Yeah, one thing. All of these places that you're talking about now, precinct approved all oh yeah no no that was that was the issue including luke's lounge the right. precinct okay. was there and approved everything okay all so in the uh all in favor all in favor all, right. uh, aye. all opposed any abstentions yeah, okay yeah, motion yeah. passed okay great so now next will be all right uh go oh i'm going to it's mediterranean sunshine it's the uh actually it is here um they did not open but I, I did visit today. Well, uh, this is the Mediterranean Cafe on East Chester Road. Okay, then on oh, yeah, 2314 East Chester Road. Um, I, we were, I was very impressed when I went to visit them today. Uh, everything seemed to be in order. Uh, Joanne, let me yes. just clarify. You're talking. You're looking at the economic development minutes, right? Yes. Yes, that's where this she's referring to. It's not on the agenda. It's, it's on the agenda, but I I skipped over Corral because I'm going to do that last. Um, and right. it's opening tomorrow, uh, based on um, when they, you know, based on what we saw and at the meeting, I think. We should we should approve it. So I I, this, is, this is where the old bowling alley used to be. Yeah, yeah it's Barnes. next. To, yes, it's ne it's at the end. Okay. Yeah, tomorrow is the hairdresser. Hair Very good. They've been they've been actually preparing for this for two years. I spoke okay. to the owner today, and uh, they had every they had their their muffins. Everything was all ready to open tomorrow. I second. <laughs> okay, good. All right, good. Yeah, I said we're very excited to have a place to have coffee in the neighborhood. But, um, and they're going to have, you know, I was very impressed with the setup as well. And they seem to have everything in order as far as the egress. There was some, a little issue with um, the front door, but I think that's something they, they can correct easily. So, um, I, so I'd like to make a. Uh, where is it I'd like to make a motion to uh, send a letter of no objection uh, regard to the it's SLA regarding this establishment. I second it. Second. Uh, uh, discussion? Discussion? Uh, all in favor? Okay. All, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? Uh, any opposed and any Except abstentions? Okay. No? Oh, okay. All right. One.